The world aviation industry consumes about 177 billion liters of kerosene. In 2015, civil aviation generated about 781 million tons of carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. At most, 99.5% aviation relies on jet kerosene, and 85% of these are used by commercial passenger aviation. Aviation emissions rose rapidly at an average annual rate of 2.0% between 2000 to 2019, with an average of 5% rise in total commercial passenger flight activity yearly. As a result of global lockdown measures, due to COVID-19 in early 2020, 57% of global oil demand declined at an unprecedented scale. The global aviation activity had declined to a staggering 60% by the end of March 2020, thus leading to the reduction in carbon dioxide emissions considerably to 495 million metric tons. What happens when things go back to normal? As the aviation industry is gradually moving to full operation, carbon dioxide emissions increase once again leading to climate changes and many others. Are there innovations to deal with these? Welcome to Energy Quest. Welcome to Energy Quest. Today, we discuss energy transitions in the aviation industry. With me is Mr. Kwame Beckwing, who is an aviation professional. Welcome, Kwame. Thank you, Leslie. Okay, so what's your job in the aviation industry? So I spent about 11 years working for Airbus, and I worked in different functions in Airbus. I started out working in engineering, in aircraft design, so I actually spent about three or four years working on wing design. And that's mm. basically entailed optimizing the wing shape, the construction and the manufacturing practices that produce the, the, the wing. Okay. So I spent about four years doing that. But my interest was always to get into the business side of aviation. Um, and um, fortunately for me, there was an opening in the marketing division of the company. Okay. Um, and I guess with my background and my interest in business, interest in travel in Africa, mm -hmm. um, I was selected for the role and I moved on to work in marketing, which is essentially marketing the product line of Airbus okay. to different customers and operators across the region. Okay. Um, and then spent some time in the sales division. So basically being the focal point, the person responsible if for leading right. sales campaigns of aircraft okay. in Africa. So what's your role? What was your role actually? So my role ended up being a director for sales for Africa. For Africa. So um, how, how easy it, it is for anybody to go into aeronautical? Um, it's, it definitely wasn't um, an, an easy path to follow. I mean, it's the same field of rocket science. I had colleagues basically going on that route. Okay. Um, getting onto the program um, is not straightforward. You know, being strong with mathematics, with science, um, is, is something that I just needed to have. And it okay. took me years to build on that capability. And, you know, I wasn't always the top of the class, but I think for me it was my passion, my, my zeal, my mm -hmm. drive, um, that just saw me get to places or, or be prepared when opportunity came along. So I was fortunate to be able to get admitted into university for, yeah. for the program. Um, and it was a tough um, three, four years. Um, it wasn't easy. Um, but, you know, I made it through um, successfully. Um, and I was able to go on to do my master's. So, mm -hmm. I mean, definitely, it's not a straightforward, it's not a walk in the park, as they yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a very rewarding career for those who get into it, yeah. You've, you've had a great career, I mean, being this young and, and all that. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Okay, but it's um, being that space, and it's, it sounds all serious. It sounds all, don't you do anything in your leisure, don't you? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, um, I play the guitar um, okay. into agriculture as well, okay. um, which is a bit more than just a hobby. It's a, 
it's a calling as well as a business. You know, I'm very entrepreneurial. Okay. So I'm into food and agriculture. Mm -hmm. I have a restaurant. Um, but I enjoy music, you know. This is, this is what I do to balance my um, busy what, life. What do you do in agriculture? In agriculture, I own a farm in, in Ghana, about a um, one-hour drive from Accra, from where we are now. Okay. Um, it's about 400 acres. We're into pineapple farming mm -hmm. and uh, production as well. I'm also into poultry production, wow. poultry layers and eggs, uh, tilapia, catfish as well. Mm -hmm. I have a greenhouse um, and then organic vegetables too. Okay. Um, so then that's on that side. On the digital side, I started a, a crowd farming platform with a group of co-founders called Grow For Me. Grow um, For Me. Grow For Me, yeah. Okay. okay. But I'm interested in the music aspect as well. Oh, really? Yes. So <laughs> you play... Um, I like play the guitar. guitar. Yes, I okay. play the guitar. Okay. Are you going to play us something? <laughs> Are you going to sing for us? <sighs> Let's see. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll play a song I was just um, listening to yesterday. Okay. Every now and then I just listen to all sorts of songs. I mean, I play anything from gospel, soul, blues, jazz. Um, okay. I'm not a musician, but I just like to play and you know, just enjoy my time. Okay. So I'll play Lean On Me, a okay. song that I really enjoyed playing yesterday. That was a really nice song. Okay. a nice one that's thank you very really much. really good you should consider music as well <laughs> so to uh, main discussion on um, emissions yes the energy transition absolutely um, focusing mainly on the aviation industry yes okay so um, as, as we well know the aer um, airplanes use jet fuel that's right yes. which yeah which um, gets all the carbon dioxide and all the green gases into the atmosphere. As we, we are transiting to electric cars and all that, what's the aviation industry doing on this? Yeah, I think it's, it's a very good question and I think it's very topical in this, uh, in, the, in, the, in this moment, particularly post-pandemic, mm -hmm. now that you know, we've gone from this space where you know, airplanes weren't flying for a number of months and people visibly noticed, you know, mm -hmm. the quality or the improvement of, of, of air. The air that we and have. I think one, the first thing we need to say is that um, air transportation only contributes approximately 2-3% of, of man-made emissions. So it's a very okay. small amount at the moment, but based on the fact that air transportation is growing, it's doubling almost every 15 years, it doubles. Okay something needs to be done just based on the trend you know to make sure that in the future it doesn't it become doesn't, a yeah. significant uh, producer so i think you know also on the back of the um, you know the cop 26 that took place in glasgow recently um, industry partners airlines have gotten together and said you know clearly something needs to be done mm -hmm. about um, co2 emissions and to make sure that you know in the future we have you know net zero carbon emissions mm -hmm. and the decision that has been come to by IATA which is the international um, uh, sort of air tra transport yes, sort of association is that we will target net zero by 2050 so 2050. in a 2050 so in approximately 30 years time mm -hmm. we are targeting net zero and how is carbon that going, emissions. To, going to be done I think there's going to be a number of areas <clears throat> that will be looked into one of them is looking into new types of fuel for aircraft and um, sustainable aviation fuels, SAF fuels, is something that I think is, is very short term in that it's been trialed, it's been tested, and we know it's something that can work. Okay. But I think at the moment, the fact of the matter is it's three, four, probably even more times 
more expensive than okay. aviation fuel today. Okay. So financially, it's not really sustainable. I mean, you know, it has to be beneficial to an airline's bottom line okay. um, to also be um, something that is uh, widely adopted and accepted. So I think soft fuels is one of them. Electrification is a second one. Mm -hmm. But I think this, again, is something that's going to be targeted to smaller aerial vehicles. Okay. Um, there are many aircraft um, manufacturers out there who are looking to roll out all electric vehicles. Um, and these seat between four to six passengers, you know, going on to eight, nine, ten passengers at this moment. But again, as um, battery storage improves, then we hope to sort of increase the size of aircraft that can, that can use this. Technology improving as well. And I think looking out into the next 10, 15 years, hydrogen is probably going to be the, the, the biggest um, probably change, I would say, or, or the biggest opportunity. Hydrogen, okay. Yes. So using hydrogen, um, liquid hydrogen, mm -hmm. which essentially works the same way as fuel, but basic, based on a hydrogen source, um, and really just targeting net zero uh, using that as a fuel source. Okay. But again, that has many issues, infrastructure, production, um, and but even in, the storage in, in of the that, hydrogen. Um, in that 20, 30 years, can the infrastructure not be, not be improved? It, it can be improved, it can be changed. I mean, it's going to be a, a radical change, I would say. I mean, today there are thousands of airports that are basically built and designed to accommodate um, aviation fuels, Jet A1. They have mm -hmm. piping under, under the ground and storage okay. units, all for one type of fuel source. So, you know, having to change that is going to require a huge amount of investment, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I think that's one of the key challenges that we're going to face. Because all around, the energy transition is happening more in the West than down here in Africa. Right. So if, if even on the, maybe I can call the cars the basic, even on that end, we are not ready for all the electrical story. So I'm wondering what's going to happen with the airline industry at this side if, if, if that comes up. I, I think, um I think in the next decade, a lot is going to change. A lot is going to happen. Um, you know, even coming out of the pandemic, we had the term the new normal and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think now there's a new generation yeah. who are coming out. You know, the Generation Z is the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And I think when they get to employment and start becoming decision makers and you know, I mean, just with their staunch views when, when it comes to carbon emissions, when it comes to environmental concerns, mm -hmm. I think there will definitely be a need to make a change. Um, because I think in, in their lifetimes, you know, in the next 30, 40, 50 years, if nothing is done today, then they're going to see the impact immediately, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. And yeah, I think that's, it's a global village. I it's mean. a global village. I mean, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't necessarily think... Um, we should always be thinking of it as, okay, let the West, you know, sort of manage that. Mm -hmm. um, we have our part to play. Yeah. Um, we may not be, I mean, when I say we, I'm talking about the continent. Africa. Um, mm -hmm. Large emitters today, we are not, we are very low. Mm -hmm. But again, when you look at the trajectory of Africa, I mean, today we're a population of 1.3 billion people mm -hmm. in the space of 20 years one in four people on this planet will be african yes yeah. because of the growth of, of the, the population youth. yeah the youth the mm -hmm. rising have, middle class and and everything mm -hmm. so i think you know there are key decisions that we as africans need have to take, to take yeah. for the future of this planet mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. so how is the aviation market in africa the market in Africa has been pretty tough over the past few years, and that's even before COVID came along. It was loss-making. I mean, in Africa... Loss-making? Yes. I mean, in Africa, we have over 100 scheduled airlines, and I could honestly say only a handful are profitable, um, mm. such as Ethiopian Airlines, um, yeah, you know, and some airlines now. in Southern Africa, but the rest of them are heavily loss-making. Okay. And I think... This is due to a number of, of reasons, you know, one of them being poor infrastructure, which limits the amount of time by which you can utilize the aircraft, the assets. Mm -hmm. um, in the West, aircraft are used for almost 14, 15 hours a day. 
But in Africa, some airlines are using them for six, seven hours. What's, what's the reason? Well, because sometimes you have airports that close, um, you know, sort oh. of, that don't operate in the nighttime because they don't have the technology, they don't have the lighting, they don't mm -hmm. have the capability. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it's it's just really issues such as such as that that limits. It's really costing the airlines. It's really costing the airlines, but also one of the big reasons for me is that load factors mm -hmm. are very low. That's essentially the percentage of people occupancy inside the aircraft. So at the moment in Africa, load factor on average is about sixty-five percent. Wow. That means planes are literally flying half empty. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the reasons for that is. Airlines typically focus on the high yield tra traffic, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. so your business people, your so high -end. politicians, your, you know, sort of the high end travelers. Um, and that sort of, to some extent, and also because of high taxation and other reasons, means so, that a flight from Accra to Lagos is going to cost you $400. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to ask the question, how many people can afford, afford $400. a $400 flight? But can it be cheaper? It can be cheaper. How? I mean, for example, in Europe, a flight from London to Paris, the same distance, can cost you twenty dollars, thirty dollars, <laughs> forty dollars. That, that's serious comparison. It same is distance. the same distance. Twenty dollars, yeah. four hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. Are yeah. taxes here higher? Taxes are significantly higher. I mean, from Accra to Lagos, taxes are in the region of one hundred and twenty dollars, one hundred and thirty dollars. Okay, <clears throat> comparatively to. Europe. So what, in what, Europe, what, maybe it? five dollars or, or so. <laughs> so there's a big difference. Yeah. <clears throat> there's a lot that can be done. I think that the industry needs to focus on the majority of people rather than the minority. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's the top ten percent of people who fly. No, but if it's if taxation is a contributing factor, then it's not just about the industry, but the governments. Right. If the governments drop tax, I'm sure the airline industry. The airline companies can yes, look at Yes, so it. for the governments to drop tax, they need to see the industry less as a cash cow, but more as an enabler mm -hmm. of something that if Trade they facilitate, yeah, exactly, if they facilitate the industry, or even if they pump money in and make it free, such that more and more people travel, through that economic activity, it's going to bring about a better benefit, a wider mm -hmm. improvement and benefit. And we've seen this in places like in Dubai, in Singapore, um, in North America, where yeah. these taxes are very low, mm -hmm. but the volumes of traffic is very high, you know, and there's a bigger benefit to the, the wider economy. So efficiency, beyond taxes, efficiency is also an issue. Efficiency, So if they yes. can be more efficient, more effective, absolutely. then absolutely. Pro probably, I mean, expense will be down and then it can be passed on it can be passed to the on passengers. to the passengers and that will be more passengers can afford to fly so therefore you won't have 65 percent load scale. factor you would have maybe 80 or 90 percent load factor wow. which is where you should be okay so the the companies that are actually developing these um, aircrafts are they also looking at the parts and are, are they bringing up new innovations that fits into this transition issue. Yes, yeah. And it's interesting you said that because I came back from Dubai just a week ago where they had the Dubai International Air Show. Um, and, you know, normally I go to the air show every, every year, either in Dubai, Paris, London. Um, and this, this was new in that I was seeing a lot more innovation, okay. a lot more technology, um, and not just things on paper or presentations. I was actually seeing drones or, or, or seeing you know, technology that had been developed. Okay. Um, and that is scalable, available today to, mm -hmm. to scale. Um, and you know, I think we are very close to seeing a, a radical change in the industry. Um, you know, my background, as I mentioned, is aircraft design. This is what I studied and everything like that. And for the past 60, 70 years, we've had the same design of aircraft. Yeah. With regards to uh, as the wing structure, the fuselage, a tailplane, mm -hmm. and, and two engines. The miniature ones we see here. Exactly. You know, yeah. this is how aircraft has, have looked over the past 60 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I honestly think that in the next 10 years, things have to change. Things okay. will change. Um, and I've looked at a number of new designs that are coming out. One of them is a blended wing body. And that does a away with yes, okay. it does away with the fuselage, mm -hmm. and this wing becomes larger 
okay. in the fuselage section. So the wing almost blends into the fuselage. The okay. And that increases the efficiency significantly. Mm. Significant. And, and also by putting the so engine... So where are the turbines going to be? The turbines will be on the top of the wing, at okay. the back. And that also is a significant... That's interesting. Yeah, it's also a significant increase in um, efficiency. So, I mean, already on aircraft, I could say that, you know, if we were to change the design, we're saving there at least 10, 15, 20%, 30% maybe mm. on emissions. So there are things we can do today on aircraft that can improve them, you know, to get to that net zero, you know. So, so not necessarily changing the kind of fuel put in there. Yeah. But not, just the design can just the design. aid on emissions. You know what? Not even just the design, also the operations, because of modern technology mm -hmm. you may have heard of ai you may have heard of big data blockchain all of these things yeah aircraft and the computers in aircraft are getting smarter and smarter okay in fact one of the things my former company is is looking at airbus airbus is looking at having aircraft flying in formation so for example you see when birds are flying in the sky and they're they're flying in a triangular formation mm -hmm. and basically the birds at the back are basically um, benefiting from the updraft or the vortices produced by the forward birds, mm. which significantly improves the, um, the efficiency of, of flying. Okay. So the question is, why don't we do this with aircraft flying today? So if flying a fleet? Flying a fleet in formation. If you have 10 or 20 or 30 or 100 aircraft flying from Africa to Europe every day, uh -huh. I mean, if they fly in formations they, of they 10, together. Mm -hmm then there'll be a significant uh, fuel burn reduction. And wow. the technology is there because of computer uh -huh. analytics, uh -huh. all this kind of technology. It's so much the case that today, pilots are, are barely flying the aircraft. I mean, you have auto takeoff. They're on auto. Auto pilots, auto landing. Uh -huh. you know, these planes can fly themselves, you know. Wow. So, you know, and there you have another 10, 15% fuel burn saving. If you bring the um, aircraft flying closer together, so rather than having them further stretched apart, you bring them closer together. So that means that when you're approaching an aircraft, no longer do you have to come in and go around in circles and then land, mm -hmm. but the computer can basically train each aircraft to come in and land in autonomy okay. at the most optimal time. So there's a saving there as well. The but savings how, at the how airport. does one, one aircraft affect the other if they're together what's the so connection we, we probably don't see it much here because you know very few aircraft that land and take off but in an airport like um Heathrow, as i mentioned before mm -hmm. where you have an airport take an aircraft taking off or landing every minute of the day every minute every minute <laughs> every single minute an aircraft takes off or lands so basically when you have aircraft hundreds coming into london what they do is they form a stacking condition uh, um, uh, formation in the sky. So they start to they form these, yeah, they start going round and round, waiting for their turn to land, okay. essentially. And you can be in that formation for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, okay. you know, just waiting for your turn to land. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is with automation, you could literally time the aircraft to arrive at a certain point at a specific time, mm -hmm. such that as soon as it gets there, it just lands immediately. It just lands, okay. And you know, there is a significant saving there. So that, that, that can happen with bigger, bigger airports like, um, like Heathrow. But w in that case, um, the smaller, let's say in Ghana, yeah. Kotuka can have that, can it? It can have that because again, we're talking about leapfrog technology. This is technology that is on board the aircraft. This is technology that is in the satellites in the mm -hmm. air. It doesn't matter where you are on the planet, you know. It could be an airstrip. Okay. It's something that where if you program an aircraft to be at this point, at this time, it can do that. So that can happen at any airport, you know. Interesting. Yeah. Really, really interesting. It is. This, this, this has been really, really, I mean, eye-opening. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about changing our fuels to hydrogen or um, sustainable aviation fuel. But yeah, yeah. It, even yeah. even the yeah. make of, of a plane. Yeah. It, it's just one element in a bigger step, you know. It's just mm -hmm. one element. But there's so many other things that can be done, as I've mentioned. T tell us a bit about the sustainable aviation fuel. Yeah, sure. So I mean, sustainable aviation fuels. Um, I'll tell you what I know. In that, it, they're fuels that can be produced 
uh, organically or from biological sources. Not fossil. You know, not necessarily fossil. I understand that even waste cooking oil mm. can produce sustainable aviation fuel. Okay. Yeah. So when you think about all these restaurant chains and I know that in the West, so McDonald's and all this kind of stuff, they take their used oil that mm -hmm. they use to make chips and everything, and they use them to power their trucks today. You really? Know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, okay. this is essentially, it's a sustainable source of, of fuel that is mm -hmm. available through, you know, sort of natural biological sources or mm -hmm. food products or animal waste or anything like that. Um, and, you know, this is something that I personally even adopt in my practice, in my agricultural practice. Mm -hmm. So on my farm, I have a bio digester. I produce my own biofuel okay. using the waste from the animal. Mm -hmm. And that powers a gas, tub, a gas um, engine, mm -hmm. which supplies all the water I need on the farm. <laughs> yeah, and wow. I have solar panels as well. So I have electricity yeah. I need. So, I mean, for example, my farm, which is a one acre farm, uh, the, the, the one acre one I have with the poultry and everything like that is fully net zero. You know, I don't even rely on ECG. No I don't rely on, no. on uh, grid power. Yeah. Everything I produce solar. is yeah, solar and bio, biofuels, biogas. Okay. Okay. So this is wow. something that we can scale in every industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not just in aviation. Not just in aviation. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much, Kwame. No problem. But um, are, are you giving back in any way? What are you doing in Ghana in aviation? I mean, giving back to the society, next generation. How are you impacting? Yeah, this is always something that is important to me. Um, for the past 10 to 15 years, I have been a visiting um, lecturer at uh, KNUST okay. in Kumasia. They launched aerospace engineering about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and every year, over the, the past few years, I haven't because of, of course, the pandemic. Every year I go across and, you know, do a talk to the students okay. um, about um, aviation, mm -hmm. you know, some of the developments, what's happening in the industry. Um, and, you know, really just mentoring, you know, because wow. honestly, there's, there's so much potential in, not only in Ghana, but across Africa. So I enjoy mentoring. Um, career advice. Many of them come back and, you know, I support them with career advice and things like that. So that's really what I do to give back. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I don't think there are too many, right. I mean, in the sector to support. Yeah. So I think you're doing very good. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. And thanks so much for being on Energy Quest. Thank you. Thank we you. appreciate your time and we hope we can have more talk later on. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And thanks for having us in your home. Thank you. So, this is what we do on Energy Quest. We demystify the energy sector and add value. Till we meet again. Ciao.